Good evening. Welcome to the Murray Honor Scholar Lecture. Uh, we have uh, Carolyn Luer here. My job as director of the Honors Program is to remind you to turn off your cell phones, please. And also, if you are a first year student, be sure to complete the note card that was given to you and turn it in at the end of the lecture. I do want to introduce uh, Jan Nurger, Dean of the College of Natural Sciences, who will introduce Carolyn Luger to us tonight. Well, it's nice to see all of you here this evening. I'm, I, as Don says, I'm Jan Nurger. I serve as the Dean of the College of Natural Sciences, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the 2017 Murray Howe Family Visiting Scholar Lecture. The Murray Howe Family Visiting Scholar Program, which I'm gonna start calling the Murray Lecture because it's just easier for me tonight, is intended to enrich the experiences of undergraduate students at the College of Natural Sciences and in the Honors Program by bringing to campus a distinguished biomedical scientist to give a lecture and spend a couple days interacting with our undergraduate student population. The Murray Family Visiting Scholar Program is made possible because of the generosity of Dr. Jack Murray and his wife Nadine, uh, Nadine Hal Murray, and they are both with us here tonight, which makes this an especially um, nice occasion, and they are sitting right there, and they will wave. So the Murrays are both uh, alums of Colorado State University. Jack Murray received his bachelor's degree in biological sciences in 1957, and he was a member of the first honors graduating class. I know. I mean, this is really good. We're number one. Well, he's number one. He won on, went on to have a very successful career as a cardiologist and a faculty member at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Nadine Murray received her degree in English from Colorado State University, and she is now a retired instructor of the University of Washington's English Department and former member of the advisory board of the University of Washington's School of Drama. This year, the committee selected Dr. Carolyn Luger as our Murray Scholar. Dr. Luger is one of the most, uh, world's foremost authorities in nucleosome structure, which is the basic unit for compacting DNA. Her research focuses on the structure and function of eukaryotic chromatin. The long-term goals of her work are to understand in molecular detail how transcription, replication, recombination, and repair take place within the context of chromatin. She is a former member, and former is a very sad thing. I'm surprised tears aren't running out of my eyes. She's a former member of our faculty in the Biochemistry and Molecular Bi Biology Department, and she held the title of University Distinguished Professor while she was here. She is currently the Jenny Smoley Carruthers Endowed Chair of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she is also a Howard Hughes Medical Investigator. In her research, um, early, or I guess like late 90s, it yielded a scientific breakthrough that effectively solved the three-dimensional structure of the nucleosome. Nucleosome is the basic building blocks of chromatin, the material in which possibly billions of DNA base pairs are compacted in an individual cell nucleus. And the journal Science, uh, arguably the most uh, prestigious journal in uh, scientific literature, included this discovery and, and uh, named it the Breakthrough Discovery of the Year in 1997. It was on the, I remember because it was on the cover of Science Magazine. And the work is now cited in nearly every modern textbook in biochemistry and molecular biology. Her work has been acknowledged with awards from the Cyril Scholars Program, the National Institutes of Health, the Keck Foundation, among many others. She has served on the National Institute of General Medical Sciences Advisory Council, was selected as the National Lecturer for the Biophysical Society in 2013, and she was named a Fellow of the Biophysical Society in 2014. I know Carolyn quite well, and she is hating this part of my introduction, because she is one of the most humble uh, women that I know. Uh, I believe when she was here at CSU, she essentially won every possible award that Colorado State University uh, bestowed on our faculty, including a Jack Cermak Undergraduate Advising Award, and she was also named a prestigious Montfort Scholar. Earlier this year, 
Uh, Dr. Luger was named to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is an extraordinary honor that very, very few people achieve. The title of her talk this evening is All Wound Up and Ready to Go, Packaging Old and New Genomes. I'm not sure if that changed, because I can't see it from here. Uh, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Carolyn Luger as our 2017 Murray Howe <laughs> Visiting Scholar. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. I'm almost speechless, which is not a good situation to be in if you have to give a talk, but I'll get over this. Uh, I'm really, really thrilled to be here. Um, as, as Dean Nurter told you, I started my career at CSU, and um, I really couldn't have wished for a better place to initiate my career. It's such a warm and welcoming and supportive environment, as I'm sure you guys are all finding out. How many of you are freshmen, everybody? Oh my goodness, yes. You're just arrived here. And uh, I just have to tell you that this is just a wonderful place. Um, and so you may ask yourself, well, why did I move, right? Um, and it was not because of football. I, I love, I still love Cam the Ram. I'm not so much into Ralphie. I'm actually not a football fan. But sometimes you just need a little bit of a change, and sometimes change is good. But um, I'm, I'm just really, really uh, thrilled to be here. I had a wonderful afternoon uh, with some of you who are maybe in the room. You better be in the room. Uh, talking, uh, attending, yeah, right, there you go. Attending freshman uh, seminar. And I was really impressed by, uh, by the clarity of your thoughts and, and the depth of the ideas that you presented. And it really gives me hope um, about the future of our planet. And that is a good thing. So anyway, let's, let's uh, talk about um, science. And I know a lot of you are not science majors, so let's keep it easy on the science and let's talk more about the process of discovery and doing science. And so because I am actually at the moment teaching undergraduate class, uh, I thought we arranged this class in learning goals, uh, as we do now, right now. I should have, um, I want you all to take out your clickers and there will be an exam <laughs> at the end. Um, and we'll, um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, so at first, I, I want to start out with giving you guys a brief history of genome science, which started way, way long time before you guys were born, and actually before I was born as well. And we'll talk a little bit about the central dogma of biology um, that some of you may have heard in high school, I hope, but maybe some of you may require a little bit of refresher. We'll then talk about how the human genome is packaged, and we'll talk about epigenetics, which often is called, and we'll see why, the X-Files of genetics. Does, do you guys still watch the X-Files? Is that still a thing? Yeah, it was a big thing when I was younger, much younger. Uh, and then if we have time and we'll see how that goes, we'll talk a little bit about how possibly genome organization might have evolved by talking about <laughs> genome organization in an ancient organism, the RK bacteria. All right. So, but, but I want to start out, and I don't really mean to sound like an old fogey, but to me really the most significant is that a word? I'm probably not. The most significant discovery um, in science, or the one that inspires me most, is of course the discovery of the DNA double helix by, um, by Watson and Crick, shown here, this really ridiculously young gentleman um, in the big picture with Francis Crick, based on experimental data from Rosalind Franklin and um, Morris Wilkins. And, uh, this discovery was really actually spurred on by the fact that in 1949, which is really a long time ago, it really wasn't a given that DNA is the carrier of genetic information. And the reason for this is because DNA is this long, long polymer made out of four building blocks. You may remember this from high school. And when you pull it out of cell, cells, it basically looks like snot. I mean, you, I'm sh it, it really does. There's no nicer word for it. And so people really thought, no way, this can be anything interesting. Uh, proteins are so much more interesting. They're three-dimensional, and they move, and they do things. And so for sure, they must be the carriers of genetic information. And indeed, they are not. And of course, um, you, you guys probably heard about um, the whole drama. You read about this at school. The whole drama of the rivalry between the two teams. Um, and um, maybe Watson Crick stealing the data from Rosalind Franklin. And all. I'm sure you remember. And now this is actually a very acclaimed uh, 
play. I'm sure it's going to be a movie soon. And Nicole Kidman is playing Rosalind Franklin. And so this is, this is actually my new goal. I want to be a scientist who is portrayed by Nicole Kidman, or maybe <laughs> if it takes a little longer by Emma Watson. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, the, the structure of, of the DNA is just simply beautiful, and it is beautiful, there's artists in the room, I know this, because it actually obeys the golden principle, the golden uh, proportions. And um, to me that raises the question, is, are the golden proportions uh, so beautiful to us because they are in us, or is it really just a coincidence? So that's something to think about. But also, uh, the structure of the DNA immediately suggested how the hereditary material could be copied faithfully because of the self-complementarity of the two strands. And so we have the process that we call DNA replication, where DNA replicates accurately, so every base pair um, Base pairs only, every base, base pairs only with, with a, uh, the exact opposite. And so this is how we preserve um, the information. But then, of course, um, DNA is translated into RNA. And from the RNA, we go into what is really interesting, the proteins, right? And so uh, we actually go from a polymer of four letters to another polymer of four letters, that's the RNA, to a polymer that has 20 letters. And so something in the middle here has to, has to be coded. So we have to have some kind of genetic code. And this genetic code was actually discovered uh, only in 1969 through a series of very beautiful biochemical experiments that I wish I could tell you about. But really the logic tells us that um, we have four letters in the DNA and we have 20 amino acids. And so we can't really encode one letter per amino acid. And so that's why we need a triplet code. It means that three, the combinations of three nucleotides um, give us 64 possible combinations. And that's plenty good enough to encode 20 amino acids. So that's all good. And so from that, it follows, follows that clearly if we could read the entire genome, all the base pairs in the human genome, we could understand life. Okay. So that's a good proposition. Now the, the problem is that humans really have a lot of DNA and uh, there's a lot of analogies to this, but the one I like is um, we have about 3 billion base pairs and that's about 200 Manhattan phone books, just filled with A, C, G's and T's in random-ish order. So that's not a very exciting reading. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and frankly, at that time in the 1980s, People just thought reading the entire genome was just plain crazy. It could not be done. Um, it was too expensive. The technology wasn't there. And furthermore, it was already known that a lot of the DNA in humans didn't really seemingly encode anything interesting. So people said, like, why should we spend so much money to sequence the junk, right? And, and, and I think it's with the cost in mind that this quote came from, uh, from David Botstein. Um, stating basically that it endangers all of us, especially the young researchers. And it took me a little while to figure out what exactly he meant by it. Was the information in the human genome so loaded that you guys are not allowed to know it? But I think he meant that it would suck so many research dollars away from basic sciences that you guys couldn't enter the sciences and all other science would atrophy. But um, uh, Luckily, um, the enthusiasm for this project prevailed, and this is just one of many quotes um, uh, stating that the total human um, sequence is really the holy grail of human genetics. And so to cut a long story short, in 1990, uh, the NIH and the Department of Energy um, proposed a 15-year project um, to sequence the entire human genome. Okay. This entailed development of a lot of new technology. The technology wasn't there at that stage uh, to map and sequence human and other genomes. So there was a lot of methods development going on. And also uh, to study e ethical and legal and social issues. What do we do with this information? Who owns this information? Can we patent this information? Those, those were all discussions that uh, were anticipated in the early 90s as this project was initiated. And lo and behold, in 2003, 
of the human genomes, gene containing regions were sequenced and they were publicly available. And this is something that was decided um, in these discussions uh, preceding the human genome. And this is really important because now no company can own the human genome. It is publicly available and you can go online and look at it. Um, there's a really fascinating link, if you're interested in this, an interactive timeline of the human genome. There was a lot of drama because as the NIH research scientists um, distributed over many um, labs in the country were plugging along at this, um, developing this technology and sequencing it, um, a businessman, Craig Venter, came along and said, I'm going to do it in half the time and for one third of the cost. And that made the NIH scientists a little nervous, and so there was a little spurring on. And this is really responsible, I think, for uh, the fact that um, the project was, in fact, finished two years ahead of time and under budget, which is really something you are not used to hearing about government projects. <laughs> but um, here we are. We have the sequence of the human genome, and all over the country, you now have people pouring over their sequences and uh, the development of the technology. So, so we have the human genome, which is amazing, and we'll talk about why this is amazing in a little while, but um, it also enabled us to develop the technology that now, today, you can send in your DNA and you can get a sequence back for $1,400. You get a little thumb stick back, thumb drive back, and voila, there it is, and then you can read um, all of nine years, I think it would take you nine years without stopping to read the entire thing. So if you want to do that, um, go ahead. <laughs> but <laughs> what does the human genome really tell us? And this is a lovely quote from um, Eric Lander, who was one of the spearhead, one of the, how do you call this? He was one of the driving forces, a major component in getting this project done. Um, and, and what he says is really true. He says we called it the human genome, the blueprint, the holy grail, uh, all sorts of things. But what it really is, it's a parts list. And as such, it is not terribly useful. Because, as he states, and this is a quote, if I gave you a parts list for any airplane, you really wouldn't know how to assemble it, and you really wouldn't understand how it flies. So there's some information is missing. And I just love this Cliff Note quote by the same man. <laughs> Eric Lander, Gino bought the book, Hard to Read, and that kind of sums it up. It's still a super valuable book because it is the blueprint of life. But we have a problem here because just like in, in one of my favorite movies, um, Contact, how many of you have seen Contact? Yeah, it's an awesome movie. You should, you should watch it. It's very inspiring. Um, aliens are giving us a building plan, a parts list, for some amazing machine. We have no idea what this machine is. It, it could be some self-destructing monster or whatever. And uh, it took Dr. Ellie Arroway um, a while to figure out that one way to read, the only way to read this building plan is to fold it in three dimensions. And so there is some spatial component to this parts list that was necessary to decipher the plan and to build this amazingly wonderful machine that I'm just dying to see in real life because it will take us to Venus and then all kinds of wonderful things will happen. So, um, so the human genome is a little bit the same. Uh, so let's talk about um, how we package and how we can edit the human genome. And let's talk a little bit about the X files. So, DNA encodes information in linear, in, in linear form. So you have a series of A, C, Gs, and Ts. It's this long, long polymer. And um, some of you may watch the 80s show or something, or 70s show. There's these things where you, you can store music on, and then you can, you can put them in a little thing, like yay big, and you can carry your music around. It's revolutionary. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was something, I'm telling you. <laughs> Everybody wanted one. So this is a cassette tape which stores music or any information in linear form. And uh, this is pretty much what, what, what DNA is. And, but so let's consider this. So let's consider that our, our human bodies, we have about uh, 200 or so different cell types. We're composed of very, very many cells, but they're also very different cell types. And there's just a couple that I picked 
because they're super pretty. I can't even read what they are. Um, muscle cells and neuro I don't have my glasses on. So they're just different cell types. There's erythrocytes. And they're all very specialized. Every single cell in our bodies has the same tape. But what is different is which music is being played in which cell type and at which times. It's almost like every cell has uh, the same tape, but it has different playlists that are organized in different manners. So this is a really complex, um, a, a really complex process, and uh, we are nowhere near close to being done to find out how this really works. And so. Basically, uh, which that's, that's basically just what I told you. Uh, it, it really determines uh, it, th which gene is expressed at which time is really determined by the three-dimensional organization of this whole building plan. Pretty much like in Ellie Arroway's three-dimensional map of the amazing spaceship. And just like any linear information, I know I hated when this happened to my favorite tape. Uh, they would break and they would tangle and it was just awful. And it usually happened to the tape that you played the most, of course. Um, and these things were expensive, let me tell you. Um, so, so there are some requirements to package our genomes um, in three-dimensional space. The space that we package it in is very, very confined. It's very confined. So it's almost like uh, having 10 miles of a very, very thin thread in a golf ball. And doing it in a manner that still allows you to then say, hmm, let me go to mile 7.25, because there's information right there that I need to become a nerve cell. So that's a really difficult problem that we're trying to figure out. So we need to uh, also protect our genome from physical damages. So we don't want this to happen. We don't want knots and tangles. Do you guys know what happens when we get knots and tangles in our DNA? We get breaking. DNA damage, is DNA damage good? No, why? Cancer, yes, nobody likes cancer. Cancer is not good. Um, so, so think about this, we have this incredibly thin thread balled up in our golf ball, 10 miles, and every time we want to duplicate our genome, we have to take it apart and split it in two, and then have an enzyme running through it and copy the exact information. It just blows my mind. I don't really know how that works. So that's why I'm in this business, to be honest. So let's, <laughs> let, let, let's just see how this, I'm, I'm a very simple-minded person. I do structures, and our approach to these questions is like, well, let's just take a close look, and let's see how it looks like, and then maybe we can figure out how this works. So let's take a closer look. These are electron micrographs of a chromosome to the left, um, and uh, on the top left, there's, chrom there's chromosomes in a nucleus that are just trying to split apart, so we're in cell division. And this has been known for a long, long time. Uh, on the right, you see a cell um, with its chromosomes all a little more spread out. And this is a cell doing, oops, sorry. This is a cell undergoing its daily business. So it's kind of um, making metabolites and it's doing its thing. It's being a nerve cell, it's making you smart, whatever. Um, and when you zoom down on, and, and you can actually see there's like some dark spots um, and there's some lighter spots. And it's thought that the dark spots are really compacted DNA. So where there's not that many genes, and the lighter, what am I doing? And the lighter spots, <laughs> I'm bad. The lighter spots are, um, are more open chromatin. When you zoom in a little bit more, you can see that these little, these fine strands, and when you zoom closer, you can actually see that there are little balls of something. So this is the, the primary organizing principle of DNA. This is at the lowest level. You see these little balls, and they're connected by these Strings and the strings are the DNA and the little balls are what we call nucleosomes. And it was known that these nucleosomes are little hockey pucks that consist of eight proteins. So you remember those wonderfully folded proteins, eight smallish proteins um, that form this little hockey puck and then we're wrapping the DNA around them. And we're wrapping only a little bit of DNA around them. Um, and so we have our genome consists of these long beads on a string like pearls on the necklace um, kind of structures. Um, and so we figured we really needed to know how these things look like because 
the majority of our DNA is organized in such a way. So all of our genome is wrapped around these little hockey pucks. So we really wanted to know how they look like. So why do we need, why do we need to know structure? Why can't we just like analyze them in any other way? I told you, I was simple-minded. I just like to look at stuff. And, and also we have seen with a determination of the DNA double helix how tremendously instructive this can be because the DNA double helix structure told us so much about it works and how our genome is divided and all that good stuff. So we figured just what the hey, let's um, determine the structure of the nucleosome. And so what we were hoping this would tell us is how the genome is organized in the cell beyond the DNA double helix and how does this affect which playlist each cell plays to become the specialized cell that we need to make up a human body. All right, so it, I'll get a little, a tiny little bit technical, don't worry if you don't get the details. Um, there is actually a message in what I'm telling you. Um, but the fundamentals of X-ray crystallography, which is the approach we're using here, is first we need to prep our nucleosomes. We need lots and lots of nucleosomes. Then we force it to form crystals. And so this is a little bit like you have a salt solution, you let it stand on your desk in a beaker, and then you get these salt crystals. And there's also things like that in chemistry, high school or middle school chemistry sets. These little crystals um, are formed in these, in these tiny little wells that you can see here. We then fish them out with a loop that's basically made out of a hair. So you bend the hair into shape, and then you fish it out. It's hung in there through uh, surface tension. And we then do the coolest experiment ever because we get to travel to a particle accelerator. And I love big machines, so this is a real treat. Uh, this is the one in Grenoble, but there's many around the world. And so they, they produce basically x-rays, very hard x-rays, x-rays with very high intensity. We shoot those x-rays through our crystals. And in 99.8% of the time, we have to go back to start because our x-ray diffraction pattern is no good. And so there's a lot of repetition in science. And as one of my postdocs aptly put it, that's why it's called research, because you have to redo it a lot. And, and he said that often enough that my grad students were just ready to strangle him. <laughs> <laughs> and, but finally, we get these beautiful diffraction patterns. And just, I just get a real kick out of this. And you don't need to understand this. But what we get from this are these electron density maps. And so these electron density maps are the outline, the three-dimensional outline of our structure. All right, so how, how, how do we do this? We need lots of really pure sample. The way we started out when I entered this field, um, my, PI, my, my postdoc mentor told me, oh, this is easy. Like, you know, just, you just crystallize them and you solve the structure and then you can do some more interesting thing. And he neglected to tell me that before me, um, about four graduate students and postdocs had tried and failed miserably. And this is, was one of the hardest projects in, in structural biology. Um, so, you know, people ask me, like, why did you do this? This is so hard. And, and I said, like, I just blissful ignorance. I had no idea what I was getting into, <laughs> literally. Um, I just wanted to learn crystallography. So uh, we, we made these, these structures. We made these things from, um, I think it was cow pancreas or something, really gross. So you had to go to the slaughterhouse. And, and, and so um, it turned out that this material was really heterogeneous and, 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 and just kind of nasty looking. And you need your material to be really pure. So I spent a lot of time making my material really pure. And I thought, aha, the reward for my two years of hard work was going to come. And it turned out, so I made my crystals from my beautiful, clean nucleosomes. And it was worse than before. So this was kind of an, a low point, you think, right? <laughs> After like two and a half years, you think you're improving something, you actually make it worse. But there's a lesson here. And I'm, I'm always saying that, um, I don't know why this is so jumpy. I'm always saying that if an experiment fails, your experiment is really talking to you and you're just not listening. So you could just say like, ah, crap, it didn't work. What do we do now? But you really have to look, why didn't it work? Analyze the failure and learn from it. And so this is what we did. And I'm not going to uh, show you the details on this. Uh, this is just to remind me to say that in the end, I was rewarded with these beautiful crystals. They're blocky, and they give beautiful diffraction patterns. And um, as you can see here, so we don't want the one on the left. We want the one on the right for various reasons. You can ask me about this afterwards if you're really interested. 
And uh, this allowed us, um, almost allowed us to solve the structure. Now this was a little bit like a triathlon. So you have this, but for various reasons that um, are um, grounded in physics and in optics, we could not, uh, from this diffraction pattern, you cannot calculate the structure. You need to, what we call, solve the face problem. So you know, you solve one problem and like, boom, there's the next one. It's like, what do I do now? So you just, you just you know, pull your pants up and you solve it. And uh, this was another three years or so where we had to do a lot of additional experiments to solve this face problem. But finally, uh, we arrive at something, and this is just a little piece of my structure uh, with the purple electron density that I'm showing you. So this is honest to God, those blue, those, those, those white little dots, those are honest to God water molecules. So we can see water molecules, how cool is that? We can see amino acids, we can see base pairs, and I just get a real kick out of this. And so you have like this, this whole structure, and you can now begin to understand how the genome is really packaged in three dimensions. So um, this, this is what Jan talked about, and this is kind of what we live for, is uh, to, see, to see our structures or our work displayed on some major journal. So this is really a lot of fun, and I have a little video just to show you the structure, just for giggles. Um, so we're just like building it from scratch, and so we we're adding the subunits, and this is based on this structure that I just showed you, and then we can turn it around and see it in its full glory. And the white thing on the outside is the DNA, so those are what your genes are packaged in. So that's what it was all about. Can you guys see this? It looks kind of weird from here. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so here it is. All right, so now we have a structure, now what? Um, what you can anticipate from this, if you're, even if you are not a scientist, if you are a machine that wants to get at the DNA, and remember, we, if we are a polymerase that duplicates the genome or reads the gene to make RNA, we need to split open the base pairs, okay? We need to unzipper it. This is a double healing, so helix, so unzippering it is kind of difficult. And it's even more difficult if you see this thing stuck to our hockey puck, so we need to um, something's got to give, right? And so this is, one of my colleagues made this very cute, uh, very cute little uh, plasticine or Play-Doh model. Um, this is what happens when a machine bumps into a, a nucleosome. It just stops dead, so something's got to give. Here's a slightly more scientific um, representation of this. <laughs> And uh, I find it sad because our nucleosome isn't smiling. I like the happy one. But be that as it may, um, we are scientists, so we have to be accurate. So no smiling nucleosomes. And you can see um, this green blob is the three-dimensional structure of the RNA polymers, the machine that plows through the nucleosome. And you can see immediately, this is not gonna work, right? So we need to do something. And the something that we need to do is we need to kick out our histones. This is just a little diagram what's going to happen. So the irresistible force bumps up to the immovable object. Our nucleosomes have to basically explode and they have to reform in the wake of it. And it's really important that they reform in the wake of the polymerase because it was shown that if you prevent that from happening, you have all this naked DNA out there. So it, doesn't get cold, DNA doesn't do that, but it, it, the polymerase now thinks, oh, there's more DNA I could transcribe, and so it just sits there and it makes, it thinks it's a gene, but it really isn't a gene. So there's all this spurious transcription going on, and so we really need to cover up our DNA, and so this is um, what we're doing um, with a group of proteins that we call, um, hang on, histone chaperones, and also chromatin remodeling factors. So there's a, the cell actually spends a surprising amount of energy getting through that obstacle of the nucleosome to pry the DNA loose and then to reform the nucleosome in their wake. So they're apparently really important. But we are really not done yet with uh, compaction. Making, putting all our DNA in these little hockey pucks that we'll see in a minute here, um, only compacts our DNA by a factor of five or so. So this is our first histone subunit. Isn't that cool? Like, the, it's kind of waving at you. 
this is all fiction, um, <laughs> but it's still awfully cute. So we make, we're making these nucleosomes, and now you can see that the nucleosomes actually start to scrunch up and form what we call this higher order structure. This is now based on pure fiction. Nobody really knows how this works, although we're trying to find out. But you can clearly see how we're scrunching up our fibers into thicker fibers and then thicker fibers. Now you have to imagine, this is where our genes are. And so trying to find the appropriate gene at the appropriate time is going to be a really hard thing. All right, I think enough said on this. Well, actually, let's wait for the cell to divide. We should be doing that. All right, so this is now, again, real life. We have our chromosomes, and they, will get it, they are getting ready to divide here. So there's now a lot of effort um, in New York Times to, to visualize in the cell how these nucleosomes pack against each other in higher order structures. And there's a recent paper that came out with a fabulous new technique uh, to show uh, uh, these are actually images to the left from a, from a group at the Salk Institute to show how uh, nucleosomes pack in three-dimensional space. All right, so um, it has been known, and I told you before many times, that a fertilized egg cell and all the specialized cell types that come from it all have the exact same DNA. Um, it also turns out that identical twins, even though they're actually essentially clones, are not identical. These two twins actually look quite different. Um, it also turns out, as we know here at CSU, that cloned animals are not identical. So why is that? There must be information. They're, they're darn similar, but they're not identical. So there must be information in addition to the genome sequence that imparts these, um, these differences. Uh, what is this? And this is uh, the rapidly growing and fascinating field of epigenetics. And um, epigenetics is actually a very old science. It comes from the word epi, above, and then genetics. So it's information that's embedded above the genetics. And it's been called the X-Files of genetics because it traditionally is used to explain a lot of non-explainable things just like the X-Files. And, and, and it, as, de as defined by uh, Waddington in 1942, um, it really describes the inherited changes in appearance or gene expressions caused by uh, changes uh, by, by mechanism other than the DNA sequence. But just like um, Agent Scully and Mulder, this definition has evolved a lot. And, and Agent Scully and Mulder are also a little um, older. and. Um, so our, our definitions have changed. But what it really is, is the um, epigenetic modifications are chemical tags on the DNA itself, shown on the left, or on the histones, shown to the right. So these epigenetic modifications are little beacons that are sticking on the DNA or on the, um, on the histones that signal to other proteins, and these other proteins will then interact with them and cause all kinds of epigenetic changes. These modifications are transient, so this is a really cool way for us to change our epigenome in response to environmental changes without changing our DNA sequence. And arguably, as multicellular organisms, we have to have some mechanism to adapt to this. And there are some fascinating studies showing that um, epigenetics, for example, in, in uh, folks in Norway has changed because their grandparents went through a famine, through an extreme famine. And so there's this very, in, very um, complicated and fascinating link to environment and epigenetics that is really now a vast field of, um, of um, investigation. And so what, what this really does in simple terms is it, it recruits other proteins, and these other proteins tell this particular region uh, how compact, how to compact, whether they should be like super compact or whether they should be like more open. And I always liken this to like a library. If you had a really ordered library, all your genes were kind of the same and easily accessible, you would have no regulation. You couldn't really distinguish between this book or this book. They would all be easily reachable. On the other hand, if you have a library where some of your books are open, like that one, and some are boxes, and some are open in the shelf, you really know uh, this is a good way for the cell 
to kind of say, well, I'm going to be a nerve cell, so for sure I'm going to need this big fat book here, but I'm not going to need all those books that can make a hair follicle because I'm never going to grow into a hair follicle, hopefully. And so this is a really good way for the, uh, for the organism to differentiate uh, cell types. Now, epigenetics is a rapidly growing field. It's gone mainstream, um, and, and what, what I, I find particularly interesting is that, um, again, they are finding a way to blame the mother because apparently, like moms, it's, everything's mom's fault. And apparently, when, you are, when you're pregnant, uh, what you eat promotes or changes the epigenetic status in the fetus, and so whatever you do or eat while you're pregnant um, has an effect on your child, and that's kind of what it is, right? Okay. So epigenetics is a rapidly growing field, as I told you. Uh, it's actually a very, um, very um, interesting and promising drug targets for a number of disorders. There's some very nasty glioblastomas and some other cancers that are now being targeted with um, drugs that change the epigenetic status of the cells. So that's a really promising area, and it's thought that um, um, that this is going to be making like seven, it's, it's going to be a huge industry. I can't even see my own writing because I don't have my glasses. But there's a lot of money involved in, in this. Um, and there's also on the scientific front, there's efforts to uh, decipher the sum of epigenetic modifications in a cell. All right. So knowledge of genetics and epigenetics, all of this is leading up to what I think is really the most revolutionary uh, discovery in recent times, and that's our ability to edit the genome with high uh, resolution. Um, so we, we are now actually able to do this in a whole range of organisms, and, uh, and uh, it, it works with very high precision. Um, and of course, it also works uh, with in, in, human, in human cells and arguably in human embryos, and it's being done in human embryos. And I think this is, um, this is a technology like no other where we really very carefully have to think about where we want to go with this, what are the implications. And I think, uh, I think a lot of people have to get informed and uh, give input into the ethical and um, social implications of this technology. Um, on, a, on a lighter side, uh, what many of you probably don't know is how this all started. So this actually all started with yogurt. And <laughs> it started with yogurt because <laughs> yogurt is, uh, is made from bacteria. So not made from, you need bacteria to make yogurt. And if you're a big yogurt company, um, you really want to make a lot of yogurt. Uh, bacteria are attacked by bacteriophages. Those are viruses that kill the bacteria. So if that happens, not good. The whole batch is bad. You have to throw it away. So these guys were trying to figure out how to make their bacteria more resistant to these viruses. They found this bacterial defense system, the CRISPR system, in these bacteria. Um, and they basically use this system not to gene edit, but to defend themselves against attack from those nasty viruses. And, and in fact, even before then, um, in the um, early 90s, um, there were people working on this technology. And uh, I think the message I want to send out to you guys is, is really, um, people are always tempted to work on what's hot. You want to work on the next big thing. You want to, but I think there's a lot of precedence for the most seminal discoveries coming out of really left field. Let's think about people studying tetrahymena, a really weirdo slime mold, and the discovery of catalytic RNA. Let's think about restriction enzymes. Do you guys know what restriction enzymes are? Yeah, you do. We couldn't live without them, at least I couldn't. They were discovered by a colleague of mine, actually, uh, when I was a grad student. He was a senior professor. He worked on these weird defense mechanisms, go figure that bacteria have. And so many seminal discoveries come from, from, these, um, from, these, from out of left field. And so be guided by your curiosity and, and don't let people think, tell you what is cool and what you should or should not be doing. If you think something's interesting, it probably is, right? So follow your instincts. So um, I think I have like five more minutes, maybe, or are we done? I could stop here. Well, 
don't, <laughs> she says. Yeah, you guys are like, oh, really? <laughs> All right, let's just talk very quickly about um, some very recent work we did um, in collaboration actually with one of my colleagues here at CSU, Tom Santangelo. Um, and and I, I love this story because it brings me back to my nucleosome roots. So if you look at, um, if you look at nucleosomes, every single eukaryote has the same nucleosome. They all look the same. And they all look the same. Even in Giardia, they look the same. And if you look at the evolutionary tree, Giardia, do you know what Giardia is? I hope not from own experience, because it's nasty. Yeah, uh, don't get Giardia. Uh, Giardia is arguably very low on the totem pole of evolution, so it's primitive, although it's been around for, for ages. But even in Giardia, the nucleosomes look the same because the histones the little hockey pucks that make the nucleosomes are super, super conserved. Between yeast and man, there may be like three or four amino acid differences. So they are just like invariant. So we can't really figure out who invented these structures. How did we, who came up with this? How did we evolve these structures? But luckily, there's a whole domain of life. We actually have three domains of life. There is, of course, us. Um, and yeah, she would be another good one for, uh, for impersonating me, I think, <laughs> if they ever make that movie. There's, there's us, there, we are eukaryotes, we have a nucleus, and that's where the nucleosomes live. And then there's the others. The others are bacteria and archaea. Bacteria are, they, these two are both single cell organisms, they, neither of them have a nucleus, they have single cells, small genomes, but archaea actually have histones. Uh -huh. Maybe this will tell us how we came up with these structures. And it turns out, um, and this is maybe a little, um, hang on, too technical. It turns out that instead of us, we have four histones with appendages and stuff. And these guys just have one histone, or maybe two that almost look the same, itty bitty histones, no exter external stuff here. And so we really just wanted to know how these structures looked like, and I just uh, want to zip through here and show you how these structures look like. And so we determined the crystal structure, and this is the structure of an archaeal nucleosome. This is our single cell organism with one single histone. I just painted them in different colors just because I could. And look at that, they're almost the same, right? They're almost the same as our nucleosomes. So this is pretty amazing. This is like three billion years ago. These guys have tiny, tiny genomes. They really don't need to compact their genome, yet they have these nucleosomes. But here's the cool part. They actually organize the DNA in exactly the same way, but watch what happens when we animate this. Please? Okay, good. So on the right is our eukaryotic nucleosome. You've seen it before. On the left is the other guy. Now look what's happening. This one on the right stops, and this other guy just keeps going. So it forms like an endless nucleosome. Isn't that cool? And it just keeps going and going and going, and that's how it organizes its genome. And uh, we really think that this happened because um, it enabled us, um, as we are expanding our genomes, we had to make these much more stable particles instead of these slinky structures. These on the left are really very flexible and mushy and slinky structures, and they're not very uh, defined because they can be any given size, and then you break apart, and then you can have another one of these slinkies. And in order to organize our genome in this complicated manner that I've shown you in the movie and that's now being revised, uh, we really needed these defined particles. And so we had to kind of switch to these um, four histone system. And this four histone system also allowed us to do all these epigenetic modifications. Archaea don't have epigenetic modifications. So what these guys did for us, they basically invented how to take DNA and bend it into shape and then just like keep going and going and going. And what we did as humans or as eukaryotes, uh, we kind of organized them in more stable particles and then we added these decorations and frills so that we could then add the epigenetic modifications so that would help us to regulate our genome in a more effective manner. So, um, what is, what is the future of the genome, or uh, wh wh where do we go from there? Uh, there's really a lot of interesting questions that we need to solve, and I, I hope that's never going to, to stop. Um, we're really interested in what are the mechanics of folding up 
this thing in three dimensions. What are the links to gene regulation exactly? And um, how can we utilize recent advances, advantages in cryo-electron microscopy to get more detailed structures of these complexes? And as you guys maybe have heard, a recent Nobel Prize was a, in chemistry was awarded for the technology of cryo-electron microscopy, which is really uh, a revolutionary technique um, that allows us to do structural biology in an unprecedented manner. Um, on, the, on the basic science or, or, or on the more medical side, um, it is very important, and there's a lot of people working on this, uh, looking at links between the genetic makeup of a person and their propensity to develop certain disease states. There's terrific resources online uh, to look these things up. Uh, there's great efforts and strides in personalized medicine, so basically analyzing your genome and then targeting your medication to fit uh, a, your particular profile. Um, the epigenome is being utilized um, as a drug target, and of course there's very intense uh, discussions about genome editing, and I think we're at the brink of a real revolution of what is possible uh, and the things we can do with the genome. Uh, and I just hope we as, as, a, as a society will be smart enough to put this technology to good use. And, and I, I just want to end with some advice from my favorite artist, Mr. Gary Larson. Uh, I know you guys are all um, freshmen and you're starting to enter labs and you probably feel like you're on a different planet and <laughs> you probably sometimes feel like these guys here. <laughs> and I just wanted to, to emphasize that it's really okay to fail. You should still land on that foreign planet and, and you know, if you have to do a face plant, do it. Uh, it's not gonna hurt that much and uh, because you'll really learn a lot. My, my second piece of advice is that, uh, and I hope I made that point in my talk, is that very often ideas come from out of left field. And so this is Mr. Einstein getting inspiration from his cleaning lady because he's really having problems with his equation and um, she's helping him a great deal. So, so don't stick your nose to the blackboard or whiteboard and be uh, attuned to your environment and take cues from unexpected sources. And, and finally, um, I, I know, I know um, we think the future is bleak, um, but it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm really hoping that we will be smarter than the dinosaurs. And listening to freshman seminars today, I'm actually very confident we will be. And I want to end with acknowledging uh, my wonderful lab um, and former and past members and, and of course CSU where a lot of this work was done and, and collaborators. And um, I would actually be really thrilled if you guys could ask some questions. So thank you very much for coming. I know you had no choice, but thanks anyway. <laughs> All right, anybody brave enough? Nobody? Come on, guys. <laughs> yes? What's the hardest part about doing research in the lab? The hardest part of doing research in the lab is um, the constant failure. Things don't work much more often than they do work. But when they do work, it is awesome. <laughs> Yep. How do you know when you get the right uh, diffusion pattern of your X-ray? How do I know when I get the right diffraction pattern of my X-ray? We look for how far out those little spots go, like look like some, you know, the little diffraction spots. The further they go, they, out they go, the better. And then uh, they also need to be nice and round. Um, so that's how you know. And then you only really know when you can solve your structures. And that's not often, that's not always the case. Yes? Do you think we'll ever get to the point where we can alter our epigenetics on the fly? Like with the Yeah, so the question was can we ever, will we ever be able to alter epigenetics? We actually can alter epigenetics, for example, by our lifestyle. That's an idea. You mean targeted, modi targeted um, changes in epigenetics are a lot harder because epigenetics are transient. They are not like our DNA sequence that is invariant, they are more transient. So that's a little harder to do. I'm conf I think there's really nothing we cannot do. 
Um, and that may be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. I hope it's a good thing. All right. Yes? Sorry, I didn't understand that. Do we have a microphone here? Come closer. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, uh, so there are like a new type of light sources. You mentioned like synchrotron radiation. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are like new type of like the three lipo lasers. Yes. I don't, uh, I don't know if like, those light sources have impact to this uh, research field. Yes, so the question was there is there's new uh, there's a lot of progress in X-ray diffraction as well, and so there's what is called free electron lasers, which are amazingly complicated instruments. Uh, they are actually really useful because uh, you can use much, much smaller crystals to determine your structure. And in theory, you don't even need a crystal. You can just take a single molecule and determine a structure. These machines are horrendously complicated. They are very much sought after, and right now it's, it's a bit of a niche application still, but I'm, as I said, I'm really confident that field is going to, to develop rapidly. I should say, though, that at this stage, uh, most, what people are most excited about is cryo-electron microscopy, because it really seems to break the resolution barrier that before was reserved for X-ray crystallography. Okay. Yeah? Um, my goal when as, as a scientist? When you started, when you graduated college, you started Oh, uh, I actually did want to be a, a PI. And the reason why I wanted to be a PI is because um, I, I, when I was a student, I lived right next to the biochemistry department. And, and I'd go to their seminars, and I couldn't understand a word. And I was just riveted by that. And, um, and, and also, they were kind enough to take me into their lab. I knew nothing. I was a freshman. And they had me do DNA preps. And I was, it was just the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. And so I really, really wanted to do that. Um, but I think more importantly, I really, really wanted to convey or pass that joy of that first DNA prep on to others. And so that's why actually I made the deliberate decision to uh, start here at CSU because uh, there's a very strong undergraduate program and you're a testament to this. And I just really like to work with students and I like to teach students and, and just train the next generation. So that was my goal and, and I was really lucky that it worked out. So yay. <laughs> All right, yes. Sorry, why was I not focused? Why was I? No, no, it's actually not more focused on the archaea. Um, it, it, the archaea was actually just a really cool side project that I started in a collaboration. Um, we just figured, like, yeah, why the heck? Let's take a look at their structure. Um, but we, I really do think uh, that it taught us a lot about how. Um, how DNA organization in eukaryotes evolved because the basic principle of bending that DNA were already there and then we just refined it a little bit. And this is a pattern that we see actually quite often uh, for other molecular structures as well, that um, if you really dig down, there really is no primitive organism. If you, if you look at an E. coli or an archaea, I mean, they do everything we do at the molecular level and they're doing it pretty dang well. Did that answer your question? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. What are some advice that you give to young aspiring scientists? <laughs> to the young, uh, don't 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 lose. I mean, this sounds really corny, but don't lose sight of the fun of it. This is really um, science is really fun. It really is, and it's tedious and it's frustrating, uh, but. The joy of discovery, I think, uh, that's just something that um, you shouldn't lose sight of. And you're, think about it. The stuff that you do could be in textbooks. You know, when I was your age, I looked at a textbook and I, 
actually never even thought about who came up with that stuff. It was just there. But your work could actually end up in there. Isn't that cool? So that's my advice. It's just to, to have fun with, with that aspect of it. And yeah, I could tell you more, but I won't. Yes. <laughs> Are there challenges facing a woman in the sciences field? Um, yes, there are. Of course, there are. Um, I th it's gotten a lot better. Um, women, uh, I mean, your testament to this, there's a lot of girls here and women, which is great. Um, I, I, we, 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 you have to keep pushing and um, going for what you want. And, and I think that holds true for everybody. Um, nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody's going to say like, oh, do you like want to be a professor somewhere or do you want to have that big job in pharmaceutical industry? You have to fight for it in a nice way. Um, and uh, that's really my advice. And don't give up and uh, don't be discouraged by some maybe little hints of sexism that may crop up occasionally. Just, you know, just grow a little bit of a skin would be my advice. Not too thick of a skin, but a little bit, a little layer. All right. Well, fabulous. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I just want to... What? There. So... We have a plaque in the honors office, which we add, add, have added her name to. So this is a continuing uh, tradition. So I want to make sure that uh, you're recognized with this. Now, um, we do have uh, goodies over here. Uh, if you want to have some cake and, and refreshments, Dr. Luger will be around afterwards. So you should come, come with us. You can just come up and talk to her afterwards. Yeah. Feel free. So have a good evening. Okay.